Napoleon Bonaparte was a cunning military tactician. He was able to lead his troops to astounding victories against forces far larger than his own. With a demoralized army of 38,000 men, he was able to defeat a, com defeat a combined total of 63,000 soldiers by separating the 63,000 soldiers into two separate groups, which he defeated individually with ease and very little loss of his own troops. At its peak, his army was able to defeat any one European country, or likely even any two. In the end, it was only defeated by three prominent European nations coming together as an allied force and opposing him together. But what did Napoleon do that allowed France to become so powerful? He disregarded the usual pattern the warring nobles followed, and pressed his advantage without stopping when he broke through enemy lines, and gained much territory for, for France with a relatively small force. He never stopped moving, and led his army to marches covering over 30 miles a day, saying, Where is the enemy? Let us go and fight him. He disliked spreading his army out evenly, because he thought it would do no good, and would often send a large force to where his enemy was weakest, with the rest of his troops sent to slow and hold out against the stronger sections of the opposing army. This tactic often worked perfectly due to the speed with which Napoleon's army moved and broke through the opposing troops. He developed turning movements that would effectively allow his army to attack from the flanks and rear, no matter what position they faced at the start. He also had many individual strategies involving ca artillery, cavalry, and infantry. No other army marched into battle with as much confidence as Napoleon's infantry, at the front of the battle, muskets readied and waiting they stood. The three different types of infantry in Napoleon's army were all fearsome. There were the line infantry, which composed the bulk of the French army, numbering about 350,000 men. These troops were generally conscripted from those aged between 18 and 25. The regiments in this force, known as demi-brigades during the revolution, were divided into three or four battalions. In 1808, the line infantry were at full strength with 108 officers and 3,862 3, non-commissioning officers and lower-ranked soldiers. The second component of Napoleon's infantry was the light infantry, which officially became part of the army in 1801, when voltigeurs or leaper companies were added to the lineups of the French line regiments. Uh, the light infantry was composed of many groups. The voltigeurs usually were usually nimble fighters whose job was it was to advance in front of the the attack and try to disrupt men enemy formations or artillery crews the skirmishers were introduced into every regiment in 1804 and they usually had the run of the field except when they ran into british riflemen and the french riflemen and their rifles whose weapons spurned by by napoleon bonaparte as being too slow to reload and who took a great toll during the Peninsular War and at Waterloo. The third component of Napoleon's infantry was the Imperial Guard. France's Imperial Guard was the elite military force of its time and grew out of the Garde des Consuls and Garde Consulaire. Napoleon Bonaparte wanted it as an example for the army to follow and also as a devoted and loyal force, doing whatever he said without question due to years of following him before he commanded the whole army. The Imperial Guard was more selective than the other infantry regiments. In order to join the Imperial Guard, a soldier had to be over 25 years old, above ad average height, no less than 178 centimeters, be literate, and have fought in a number of campaigns and served at least five years. The benefits of life in the Guard included better food and clothing, as well as higher pay. Usually kept in a reserve, the guard was often thrown into a battle as the killing blow. Of course, the morale of, of line troops soared when the grumblers, as they were affectionately called, moved forward into the fray. <laughs>